Jesus, even in the face of opposition and sometimes even death threats in martyrdom. So, we are continuing in my book called Praying the Gospels, Jesus, Miracles in Galilee. You can still get that at EWTNRC.com, where it is item number 52885, 52885. And we are now taking a look at the martyrdom of John the Baptist and the return of, of Jesus' disciples from their mission. Let's start off with the martyrdom of John the Baptist. We're looking at Mark chapter 6, verses 21 to 23. That reads, An opportunity came when Herod on his birthday gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and for the leaders of Galilee. When his uh, when the daughter, uh, let's see, when Herodias' daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, ask me for whatever you wish and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her, whatever you ask me, I will give you even half of my kingdom. Now, this is this, uh, just a little side point. Uh, some of you may know a number of people who belong to the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Kingdom Hall of Jehovah's Witnesses. And they don't celebrate birthdays. They're not allowed to. And the reason for it is this passage, along with the passage about, Herod, uh, about the Pharaoh's birthday party. They say that there are only two birthday parties in the Bible, and at both of them, somebody died. Well, that's true, but, you know, there are a lot of other events in the Bible where bad things happen, but you can still do them. So that's not good reasoning, but that's the reason they do that. Just a little sideline. If they don't want to celebrate birthdays, I mean, I know plenty of people uh, who don't want to know about their birthday or celebrate it, so, but for different reasons. Well, here we see at this birthday party, the entertainment is to have Herodias' daughter Salome dance. And this is very typical of the Middle East, um, that women, are a very common way of entertaining by dancing. And uh, the thing that's unusual here is that it's a member of the royal family who is doing the dancing. Normally, it would be slaves who did this. That would be the normal process in a royal court. There might be other people um, who have lesser morals, Sometimes prostitutes and such would be brought in for this. Um, but it was very unusual for somebody from the royal family to do the dance. And there's, the Gospels are very discreet in implying that there was something indecent about the way Salome danced um, and about Herod watching this dance. Remember, his wife was Herodias. She had been the wife of his brother, Philip, and he took her. Now, one of the things going on with Herodias is that she was also the niece of Herod and Philip. So that's one problem already. There's incest going on in that he married not only his brother's wife that he took from his brother, but also it's his niece. And then Salome is therefore his grand niece. And this adds to the indecency of her performing a dance that pleased him and his guests so much. Probably, again, in some way that 
so showed more than simple professional ability. You know, this there's something more about this. And the enthusiasm and the extravagant offer. I mean, to give half of his kingdom to Salome was really extravagant. Now, one of the things that we see is that Salome has no more common sense than Herod. Making such a wide open offer, it shows no good sense. If you remember, perhaps, back in the book of Judges, Jephthah had what was one of the judges. He had an open ended vow. He said, whoever walks out of the house first will be sac a sacrifice to the Lord. He was most likely thinking about one of the animals, but it was his own daughter and he sacrificed her. You don't make foolish oaths. And that is put in the book of Judges because it happened and because it shows his foolishness and the foolishness of making such an oath. Herod is just as foolish as Jephthah. And as a result of having a foolish oath, more than a birthday party, Herod commits murder. So here, the, the Herodias, or excuse me, Salome, the girl, after her dance, didn't know what to ask for because she has no sense. And she says to her mother, what shall I ask? And Herodias had no doubt. She said, the head of John the baptizer. Immediately she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. Now, her mother didn't ask for the platter. The platter was the idea of Salome. She'd get something out of this. Um, if, if she doesn't, you know, she's not going to keep the head of John the Baptist, but she would be able to keep the platter. And at that point, um, we see that Herod Antipas folly, this, this rashness that he showed, um, that was motivated by a lust that blinded him to n normal decency. I mean, He's, again, the implication in this is that the dance inflamed him with lust along with his guests. And this indecency that he has blinded his eyes. He didn't think clearly with his head. He wasn't being rational. And he now, because he had made such a big oath, he was, in fact, powerless over the request of Salome. There's nothing he can do to stop this. And that's why it says in verse 26, And the king was exceedingly sorry, but because of his oaths and the guests, he did not want to break his word to her. He didn't want to refuse her. Immediately, the king sent a soldier of the guard with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison, brought his head on a platter, and gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard about it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. Now, this... The, the location of this is actually known from a Jewish historian named Josephus. If you ever get a chance, it'd be, it's a, there's a lot to read in this, but it's worth reading Josephus. You can get inexpensive versions of Josephus uh, at bookstores, and you can also get inexpensive, uh, you get free versions of it on the internet. It's all available. Um, Whiston did the translation a long time ago, so it's cheap now. And the, uh, in there, he describes that the, the 
deed was done and the party was at the fortress of Machaerus, that's what it's called in Greek. Today, it's in the kingdom of Jordan. I've been there a couple of times. It's called Machaer in Arabic. And this is where he was, he was killed. And uh, you can go visit it. It's, it's still accessible, that's for sure. So he had to think about his, you know, Herod had to think about his own words and all of the military and political leaders that were there in front of him. And for him, it was more important to keep his foolish oath than it was to keep the word of God. Now, this brings a very basic point. We need to have our lives guided by the word of God. And he didn't. He had already taken his brother's wife, so he's committing incest that direction, and it's his niece, that's another direction of incest. He's filled with lust and makes a, a foolish oath, certainly going against the Eighth Commandment to make such a foolish oath. And then he commits murder. And he's got a whole rack of God's commandments that he's breaking here. And this is something that is very, very important, that his incest, lust, and murder, and false oaths, all this. And so he keeps his word to go and kill John the Baptist. And he gives it to her and fulfills that word. And you see that his family is in this moral tailspin. So, I mean, the girl herself was doing an indecent dance. Her mother is asking for the head of John the Baptist. And it wouldn't be but a few more years after this that Herod and Herodias are exiled out of the country, the emperor, Caligula, exiles them to Gaul, which is today France, because he realizes that their ambition is building up an army and he's afraid that they're going to rebel against the empire. So he has Herod Antipas and Herodias kicked out of the country and sent to Gaul for exile. Um, this is all part of the moral tailspin that the family goes into and the very attempt to become wealthy, famous, and powerful is out of control. And this is something that's very important to remember. Sin, as, as it begins to pile up, once you start to give yourself permission to commit sin, you keep giving yourself permission to do more sin. You don't get it out of your system. It's rather that you build up this bad habit. And this is part of the reality that people today have to pay attention to as we see a variety of things going on that are our, our culture giving permission for sin. Look at these so many of these cities where the district attorneys give thieves permission to steal. If you steal $950 or less, it's okay. They let you get away with it. These are the kind of things going on. That kind of sinful spiral is taking place here. Now, I'd like us to take a look at another aspect of this. Namely, the way that John the Baptist is our Lord's forerunner. Sometimes he's called the precursor. Precursor is just another way to say forerunner. Forerunner is Anglo-Saxon. Precursor is a Latin root. That's all. Uh, and the reason he's given that title of forerunner or precursor is because he anticipates some of the very important elements of the life of Christ. And then Christ recapitulates it, but takes it to a new level. Think about this. Both of them had their birth announced by the archangel Gabriel. To Zechariah, the father of John, and to the Blessed Virgin Mary. 
And on one hand, it's a miracle that this elderly couple, when the woman is past the time of giving birth, you know, is able to conceive. But with Jesus, it's a bigger miracle that a virgin conceives and she gives birth to a son. Then we also see that John preached a call to repent and believe because of the coming kingdom of God. Jesus preached the same and went around Galilee preaching, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Here we also see that John dies as a martyr and is buried by his disciples. Later on in the gospel, we see that Jesus is uh, also killed and he is buried by his disciples. But what is going to go on is that it will exceed the power of John's death because by the death of Jesus, our sins are forgiving, forgiven. That is not the case with the death of John the Baptist. And we'll also see that the uh, b death of Jesus leads to his glorious resurrection and ascension. And that will initiate a whole new commissioning of his disciples to go out on mission to the ends of the earth. And that's going to be one of the reasons that the death of John the Baptist is followed by the story of the return of the disciples from their mission. Because St. Mark is showing us by putting together the death of John the Baptist and the return of the mission of the apostles of Jesus, that they are going to have to speak the truth about Jesus, speak the truth about what is good and righteous and true, and they will call to be faithful like John the Baptist, even when there's opposition from sinful people and threats of death and actual death. This is the reason that they're put together with the death of John the Baptist. So that's going to be a very important element here for us to reflect upon. Now we have to take a little break. We'll come back in just a couple of minutes, so please stay with us. Many of Father Mitch Pacwa's books are available through the EWTN Religious Catalog. To get your copy of any of these works, including his book, Wheat and Tares, Restoring the Moral Vision of a Scandalized Church, log on to our web store, EWTNRC.com, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, or call 1-800-854-6316. EWTN home video highlight for January is The Passion of St. Edmund Campion. Under the virulent persecution of Catholics known as the Reformation, St. Edmund Campion tenaciously and lovingly held firm to the faith during one of the darkest periods in history. There is evidence enough of your treason. I am a Catholic man and a priest. In that faith, have I lived, and in that faith do I intend to die. If you esteem my religion treason, then I suppose I am guilty. Order your DVD at EWTNRC.com, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, or call 1-800-854-6316. In this age of fear and confusion, where abortion and euthanasia and suicide are all too commonplace, God has summoned us, each of us, to remind others who they are, to invite them to a flourishing life, 
and to share the good news that nothing and no situation is beyond the love and mercy of Jesus Christ. Welcome back. We were just going over the episode in St. Mark chapter 6 about the death of John the Baptist, and I want to consider a couple of things more and apply elements of the death of John the Baptist to modern disciples that we, just like the apostles, have to realize that the death of John the Baptist may presage, and it would presage, what would happen to them because they were all martyred as well for their witness to Jesus. So we need to consider our own willingness to be faithful to Jesus, our Lord, in all circumstances. Not only where people like us because we're acting better, but also when people oppose us and hate us and even want to kill us. So in this gospel story, John the Baptist was martyred because he faithfully defended marriage, marriage as God had revealed it and intended it for all people. He defended it against adultery, against incest, and uh, against, uh, in effect, abuse of a daughter, a stepdaughter in this case. So that's one element. And we have to ask ourselves, because this is extremely relevant in our own times, where are we willing to speak up in favor of marriage today? There are major problems with marriage. We have an extraordinarily high divorce rate, 50%. And though it's interesting, in couples who use natural family planning, the divorce rate is about 2 or 3%. Think about that. That would, you know, this, it's a very interesting phenomenon. But, you know, marriage is meant to be until death do you part. We also see a high rate of adultery by men and women. It's over 50 percent, according to some of the studies. So that's something that's extraordinarily high. And we have to speak against it to our own hearts. And we also have to speak against it in our society where it is all over the place. And lots of people think that it's, it's something acceptable. Fornication is even more acceptable. So that today it would be a vast majority of young people. And we also see that 52% of American children born today are born to unwed mothers and fathers. Their parents don't get married. That's over half of children. And in the African-American community, it's closer to 78%. This is a, a, a huge change. When I was born in the 1940s, it was a 4% rate nationwide. And African-Americans had a lower rate than did Caucasians. And now that's changed. We have to examine why. And that's something to, to, to discuss. We also see that there are various same-sex unions and other changes that are called in our society a new normal. This is called the new normal. 
But we also have to take a look at the effect of this and speak up about the effects. So, for instance, how many times when people are committing fornication and they conceive a child, do they commit the form of murder known as abortion? How many times when people are living together do we see violence against the women in particular and violence against children from previous unions, both sexual violence and uh, physical violence? These are common things. And it's, it's going on uh, today. We also see that when children are born to parents who are not married to each other, usually they're left in the custody of one, usually the mother. By far, that's the majority. The men are gone. And they never learn the manhood that comes from being responsible for their children. And as a result, 60% of the daughters of unwed parents become unwed mothers themselves. And, when you, and there's a high, higher rate of drug use in that population, higher rate of suicide, and a much higher rate of incarceration. If you saw this special that I did uh, in the prison for Christmas, in the Christmas celebration there, 80% of men and women in prison are the children of unmarried parents. These are serious consequences of sin that the parents committed, not the kids. That's not their fault. But they have consequences of all kinds. And we have to speak about these things as well as take action so that we can be people that are available, make ourselves available as substitute mothers and fathers, grandmothers and grandfathers, aunts and uncles, people who are there through boys clubs, girls clubs, and these other organizations to be responsible adults that give guidance and especially give love to these young people whose fault it is not. You don't blame them, but you also help them to have empathy for other people so that they themselves do not repeat the same problem. This is, uh, and it, it is something that is often repeated. You know, um, so this is something that we need very much to do. And we have to ask ourselves, are we willing to take the risk and speak up for the commandments of God? It's not that I think it's just naughty or it's not very nice. No, it's not about that. It's about God giving us good commandments that make good sense and that we need to preach for that good sense. The experiments that people are trying on our families and especially on our children are causing great harm for the vulnerable in our society, especially the children. They are the ones who suffer by this. And adults who want to make sure that their career their advancement, their vision of what they want to do is more important than the lives of these children. They need to be addressed by people with good sense and good hearts and with empathy, but with clarity. Speak up the gospel of Jesus Christ about marriage and family and good sense about family. Children need a mother and a father. Goofy people who try to say that, you know, uh, you can just, one parent can do it all. They can, but there's still going to be elements missing. As generous as one parent might be, there are just the male and female genius that complement each other and help round a child out 
to see a variety of aspects of life that come from being raised by their mother and father. And this is something that we need to promote today. So, this is something then we can consider for our own prayer. One way to do that is imagine standing next to Jesus when the disciples of John the Baptist bring him the news that John was killed and he learns about his death. What would you say to Jesus or what would he say to you about the meaning of the death of John the Baptist? What would that matter to you? Ask what he might say to you about the need to have courage like John the Baptist to speak up in today's world, to speak up against drug use, against you know breakdown of family. What would he ask of you? And ask our Lord, how would he want you to evangelize? Not just what you think or somebody else think about you. What would our Lord Jesus want you to say about the gospel and today's society and today's needs? And what would he say is at stake in this for you? Why would this matter to you? Talk to him about that. That Remember how he said John is going to be the, uh, you know, in the kingdom of heaven, but he's the greatest born of woman. But he's, he's not as great as people born into the kingdom of heaven. And does this have something like that in stake for you? This is something that you might consider and then conclude your prayer with the prayer, soul of Christ, sanctify me. Body of Christ, save me. Blood of Christ, inebriate me. Water from the side of Christ, wash me. Passion of Christ, strengthen me. Within your wounds, hide me. Make that prayer and use that as a way to conclude your, you know, speaking to Jesus as a friend to a friend. This would be a very helpful thing. All right, we'll stop there and we'll continue next week with the mission of the apostles and, uh, and what the ramifications of that. Now we'll get to some of your questions. We have Joan in Pennsylvania calling. Joan, what can we do for you? Hi, Father Mitch. I have a question about John the Baptist. Yes, ma'am. Asking... Um, like, is this really Jesus, God? I forget what quote and verse, but yeah. you, you know all, all of those type things. Yeah. And um, I was wondering, you know, like, he would know because Elizabeth, um, Mary, you know, like, he lived. And doing that so Jesus um, could answer it in his own words, and then it could be like quoting Jesus and written down in the Bible instead of any type of tradition things, or what, what's your take on that? All right, so I had a little, you were breaking up a little bit in your call. Um, so you're asking about when John the Baptist sent his disciples, this is before this, and you see that, for instance, in uh, the Gospels of Matthew and Luke, uh, where John sends his disciples and says to Jesus, they ask Jesus, are you he who is to come? Right. Is that what you're talking about? Yes. And what was Wouldn't your question about it? that exactly? Wouldn't he have known it? Uh, or was Would, he doing it for our benefit? For oh, Jesus? okay. All right. Um, so he, um, he uh, and why would you think that he might know him? Um, because when Mary came to visit uh, mm -hmm. Elizabeth, um, I mean, he left with joy in her room. So I thought there might be some type of spiritual other way of knowing mm -hmm. on like a higher level. 
that Jesus and him. Plus, yeah. I mean, if he would have went to Passover or the other feasts, I'm assuming that they were Jewish, so they would have done the same things. He would have seen Jesus on those events as were happening. Okay. Couple things to keep in mind, okay? And this okay. this is good to to uh, now I see where your question is coming from. Um, the number of things to keep in mind. Do you remember at the end of the uh, chapter one of Saint Luke's Gospel? It says that everybody was talking about the birth of John the Baptist, but then it says that he was. Um, uh, raised in the wilderness. Do you remember that? Yes. Okay. How old was about? <laughs> well, see, this is one of the things to keep in mind. He would have been very small. His parents were elderly. And in the, there's a book called the Proto Gospel of uh, James. In that book, it mentions that Zechariah was martyred because he didn't turn John the Baptist over to Herod when Herod killed the holy innocents. So he was martyred when John was just uh, less than a year old, just a few months old. And secondly, uh, his mother was already elderly. So he was raised in the wilderness and this is not in the Bible text, but this is me putting two plus two and connecting a bunch of dots. He was most likely raised by the Essenes who lived near Qumran, where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, that the community that wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls had as one of their common practices to raise orphans, especially the orphans of priests. And then when they were 18 years old, they would give them a chance to either stay in the community or to leave. But they would live with them uh, a, a, until they could go off on their own, either as the scenes or not. I suspect John was part of that community and had been raised by them, and would not really have been around Jesus. I, I don't know about you, but I have a number of, I have a lot of cousins. And some of them, uh, for instance, I recently uh, got to spend time this summer with one of my cousins, whom I had not seen since 1972. I just haven't, we just haven't seen each other because he lives in another part of the country that I don't frequent. So, you know, this is the kind of thing that's going on. They would not have had much contact. Now, John recognizes Jesus at the baptism because he sees the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove over Jesus. And John says that in the Gospel of St. John, chapter 1, John the Baptist says that he saw and heard the Father speak and the Spirit hover over him like a dove. So he's witnessed that. But then despite saying this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, John is in prison for a while. And it was probably two years that he was in prison, a year and a half, two years. And as he's in jail... And, you know, we don't see the kingdom of God coming in to get him out of jail. He begins to wonder, are you he who is to come? Now, that phrase, he who is to come, is from the prophet Malachi, chapter 3. And it says, it's speaking about the Messiah as the one who is to come. In Hebrew, it's just one word, haba the one who is to come. And Je Jesus answers, tell John that I, you know, the blind are, can see, the lame can walk, the deaf can hear, and the poor are the good news preached because 
he is fulfilling the prophecies of the Messiah. So yes, I am the one who's to come. But John still doesn't have full understanding of what that redemption means. And he won't see Jesus dying on the cross in, during this life, but he will be a forerunner, a presage of what will happen. And that God's way of redemption will be the death of Jesus and resurrection. John won't quite see all that. So that's why he's asking those questions. He's unsure, but then Jesus reassures him and he remains faithful to this point where Herod kills him. Okay? All right. We have to take a little break. We'll be back in a couple of minutes with more of your emails and questions, so please stay with us. family. Mother Angelica once said that the legacy of EWTN would be the fact that the network was created and sustained by relying entirely on divine providence. She knew that special individuals, people who loved Jesus and his church, would step forward to donate to EWTN. She was right. Throughout our 42-year history, EWTN has been blessed with many people who support this mission of proclaiming the eternal word, Jesus Christ, to the world. With your help, the network has inspired countless individuals, those who've come into the church, fallen away Catholics who've returned to the sacraments, and the homebound who can watch daily mass. I ask that you consider making a gift today, a gift that will inspire people worldwide to grow closer to our Lord, His Blessed Mother, and the saints. And I hope that you'll go online and let us know the ways that Jesus is working in your life and how EWTN has helped you on that journey. I look forward to hearing your stories. Thank you for being a part of our EWTN family. May God bless you. Please make a donation today at EWTN.com slash my story. You may also call us at 1-800-447-EWTN or send your donation to EWTN, 5817 Old Leeds Road, Irondale, Alabama, 35210. And don't forget to share your story with us during EWTN Donor Appreciation Month. Go online for more details. Though I have much to write to you, I would rather not use paper and ink, but I hope to come to see you and talk with you face to face so that our joy may be complete. 2 John, verse 12. I just want to let you know that tomorrow night on EWTN Live, which is at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, we will be speaking with Lewis Brown Jr. He is the Executor Director of the Christ Medicus Foundation. This is dedicated to upholding human dignity and maintaining religious freedom and health care for medical professionals and their patients. We'll also discuss the Curo Healthcare Community, which offers Catholics a pro-life healthcare sharing option. And that's important because sometimes healthcare providers are you know, not concerned with every aspect of health, including you know, issues like abortion and such. So this is a pro-life group, so it'd be very important to know about. All right, so let's take uh, an email here. This one is from Bonnie. Bonnie asks, uh, Dear Father Mitch, at Mass it is my heart's desire to receive the Eucharist directly from the hand of the priest who consecrated the host rather than an extraordinary Eucharistic minister. 
understand their use in emergency situations, but not just for saving a few minutes in order to end mass more quickly. If the priest directs me to the extraordinary, I stand my ground to receive from him. Am I wrong in this, Bonnie? Um, you know, try, you know, I understand. And there are some folks that do that at church. Um, uh, at our parish, we uh, don't have extraordinary ministers. Uh, either the priest or the deacon uh, distribute Holy Communion. Um, uh, we just don't, uh, Maronite Rite just doesn't have uh, the extraordinary ministers. But, you know, it's, you know, the, the focus, and I understand your, your, your concern, but I would, you know, also urge you to keep your focus on Jesus himself. This is the main reason from whose ever hands you receive you're receiving our Lord Jesus. And you have to keep your attention on Him. Now, if you can, you know, get to your preference and, and be in the line where the priest is standing uh, without causing disturbance, uh, that's, that's fine. Um, but you don't want to cause a disturbance because you don't want the people around you to be distracted from the presence of Jesus because of you either. You know, your concern is fine. Like I said, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but you don't want to have any kind of distraction from the essential element, which is that Jesus, our Lord, is present and that you're receiving him and so are these other people. And that his presence is the number one most important element here. And so make so stay in that spiritual communion with Jesus as you receive him sacramentally in communion. Okay. Then we have another email. This one is from Stacy. Stacy asks, Hi, Father Paqua. When we suffer, do we suffer only for ourselves? Or is it in part for reparation for others? I imagine suffering is complex, but I was hoping you could offer some clarity, Stacy. Well, I hope I can give a little clarity, Stacy. Um, suffering is complex. And whether it is something that you endure just on your own, or whether it becomes reparation for others is much more dependent on whether or not you are uniting your suffering with Jesus Christ. It's not just that it's suffering that does good for others because of who you are, but rather it is because of who Jesus is and what he's doing. And one of the things I would emphasize is that when you have some form of suffering, there are all kinds. Some are voluntary as when we fast. Some are involuntary as in sickness, accidents, loss of a loved one through death and so on. Well, no matter what kind of suffering it is, bring it to mass. And at the offertory of Mass, take your suffering as a gift and spiritually offer it up and put it with the bread and the wine. And let it be present on the wine. Because again, bread is wheat that suffered. The wheat was crushed, mixed with water and baked. The wine is made by crushing grapes and fermenting it. That's a great symbol of our suffering. But then... At the consecration, just as the bread and the wine are consecrated into the body and blood of Jesus, so also does our suffering get united with him. And it's because our suffering is united with that of Jesus Christ that it is able to have an effect on other people. And then, of course, in the Holy Communion, this is a sign of the resurrection. The priest breaks the host, 
puts a fragment in the body uh, of the body of Christ in the precious blood to symbolize the resurrection of body and blood are reunited. And this is the hope that the suffering will do good. And, you know, the real trust in the power of his resurrection. So all of that is the way we do that. Okay. All right. We have a caller online. Jane, you are calling from the Commonwealth of Virginia. What can we do for you? Oh, I have a good question for you. As Thank a you. Catholic, I believe in purgatory. Mm -hmm. And I have many non-Catholic friends that laugh at me because they don't believe in purgatory. They're going uh -huh. straight to heaven while I have to put my time in. Uh -huh. And I want to know, is that true in their religion, that are non-Catholic, that yeah. they go straight to heaven, but I have to do time? That's a that's a kind of question that we might ask on the streets of Chicago. Yeah, do I still have to do time, Judge? No, no. That this is this is something that applies to everybody, whether you know it or not. So, for instance, it says in Scripture that nothing unclean can enter into heaven. Nothing. And, you know, you have to do this not in a point of arguing with your friends, but in a point of actual communication with them and say, you know, do you, you may have repented of past sins, but do you still ever have a lustful thought that comes to your mind? Do you still ever have, even after you've repented, you still have a, a, a moment of anger at somebody who offended you or a desire to get revenge? Does that still ever occur to you? And then ask them, ask them this. Do you think that those thoughts of lust can come into heaven? Do you think that that revenge can come to heaven? No way. There's no room in heaven for that. There's no room in heaven for past temptations to greed. Even though you say, oh, I still wish I had that Rolls Royce or whatever. Um, you know, there's no room for that. And so do you think that Jesus is going to cleanse you of those lustful thoughts, greedy thoughts? avaricious, angry, vengeful, all those thoughts are going to be cleansed or are you going to try to bring those into heaven? And ask them that and simply say, it's not just going to be that you get away with anything. None of us, none of us can bring those kind of thoughts into heaven at all. Does that help? Well, it helps some, but how do I tell my non-Catholic friends when they laugh at me that they don't have to do time, whereas I, I had to do time? Well, I mean, here's, how do I get across to them that they yeah. have to do time, but it's maybe not in purgatory, but it's somewhere? Well, it'll be purgatory. All that purgatory means is the, it's the place of cleansing. And if they are without sin... They won't have to go. And same is true for you. If you are without sin, then you don't have to go to purgatory. It's not a requirement uh, unless there is some, of, some offense still clinging to us. And they, you know, you, you can f ha have them reflect on how, you know, anything of sinfulness that you still have running around your little mind or will, will have to be cleansed before you. Now, you may not want to call it purgatory. We call it that because it's a convenient way to explain God will purge us of all sin and all wrongdoing. And, uh, and that's for the redeemed. It's not a second chance, of course. And if they want to laugh, they can. But maybe when, if, if, 
they and you should end up there. You know, um, maybe we can laugh that we laughed about it. You know, that might be part of the cleansing process. But I would, you know, just urge them, you know, that, that uh, just remind them of the, what it says at the end of the book of Revelation, nothing unclean can enter into heaven. And that means you and me. But also what means you and me is that we have run out of time. Uh, we're just about at that point in the program. So may the Lord bless you all and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you. May he purify you of all sin and fill you with all grace. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And again, we can bring you this program and all the other programs we have, especially this upcoming, uh, you know, uh, right to the walk for life and all, only because the network is brought to you by you. So please remember to keep us in between your gas bill, electric bill, and cable bill, and we'll pay all our bills too. Thank you. God bless. of pain, grief, and confusion, we often cry out to God with questions. Why me, Lord? God, where were you when this happened? In Prayers of Desperation, a questioner's prayer for answers in our darkest moments, Bishop Robert J. Baker, a longtime friend of EWTN, wants to help you bring those questions to God as prayers of faith and trust in Him. In these pages, Bishop Baker shares comforting prayers, meditations, and lessons from biblical giants and saints that can help you travel the road from desperation to hope. Prayers of Desperation, a questioner's prayer for answers in our darkest moments by Bishop Robert J. Baker. The latest release from EWTN Publishing. Now available at EWTNRC.com or call 1-800-854-6316. I'm Tracy Sable. Tonight on EWTN News Nightly, growing concerns and questions over President Joe Biden's handling of classified documents. Plus, a report from Rome following Saturday's funeral for Australian Cardinal George Pell. Join us for news from a Catholic perspective on EWTN. EWT, live truth, live Catholic. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. You expired, Jesus, but the source of life gushed forth for souls, and the ocean of mercy opened up for the whole world. O font of life, unfathomable divine mercy, envelop the whole world and empty yourself out upon us. O blood and water, which gushed forth from the heart of Jesus as the fount of mercy for us, I trust in you. O blood and water, which gushed forth from the heart of Jesus as the fount of mercy for us, I trust in you. O blood and water, which gushed forth from the heart of Jesus as the fount of mercy for us, I trust in you. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. 
Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, 